I want you to open a Bible to Acts chapter 24 as we continue our summer series going through the second half of the book Acts, looking at the life of Paul in the early church and learning what it means for us as followers of Christ to believe in the gospel, not just for ourselves, but in such a powerful way that we are willing to sacrifice and do whatever it takes to share it with the world around us. And so as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word, we begin with prayer. And our first prayer this morning is to pray for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would give them peace and understanding of God's word this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters gathered with us this morning that the Holy Spirit would open their hearts and minds to receive the message of Jesus and his love for them. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would preach faithfully true the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ of salvation for all people who believe and trust in him. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So the Bible is filled with lots of wonderful statements and promises. Would you agree with me on that? I don't think we're going to have a big fight about that one. How many of you, when you are struggling, hurting, confused, whatever adjective or adverb you want to pick for that moment in your life, Turn to God's word as a source of comfort and encouragement, right? We, we do this all the time, right? And it's because God's word is beautiful and true and it's good for us, right? That's why we always open our Bibles on Sunday mornings to go into God's word. And we know that God speaks promises to us as his children to remind us of his love for us, his comfort and encouragement for us. Now, would you also agree with me, this is the less exciting part of the sermon, that the Bible also says hard things, like difficult truths, right? That we don't always want to listen to or apply to our lives, right? So some very famous promises from Jesus, from God's word, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the promises I have for you, right? Promises to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future, not to destroy you. Anybody familiar with that one? All right, that's a great one. We always turn to that one. Romans chapter 8 says, I know that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. In Matthew, Jesus tells us, don't worry about tomorrow. I know that's hard not to do, but he says, don't worry about tomorrow because what? The Father knows what you need and he will take care of you. Peter tells us to cast all of our cares on him because he cares for us. Jesus makes a wonderful promise again in the Gospel of Matthew where he tells us, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you what? Rest. See, you know, you're familiar with that one. So what we love is those promises, right? Amen? We, we get excited about those, right? If I had told you that's what the sermon's going to be all about, you would be a lot more excited than what it's actually about. <laughs> because the Bible also has in it Good truths from the Lord, commands from God himself for us as his children to do that are a little less exciting and comforting to us than come to me if you're, if you're burdened and I'll give you rest. And in today's text, as we're looking at the life of Paul, Paul's now, the last part of Acts is basically Paul going from one trial to another, defending himself and the faith. And the hard thing about these trials, from our perspective, is first, God is the one that puts him in those situations. Second, he's in those situations because he was faithfully doing what God had commanded him to do with his life. And then thirdly, Paul was innocent. He hadn't done anything wrong. He hadn't broken any laws, but people simply didn't like him. So they would put him on trial multiple times. So I want to share with you a few verses from Jesus that apply to the church, apply to all Christians before we get into the story of Paul. In Mark chapter 13, Jesus gives one of his most important sermons. It's not very popular because we prefer the story of the prodigal son and the good Samaritan and those kinds of sermons. 
but it's still very important. And he's talking to his disciples, he's talking to the church, and he tells them, not everybody's going to like you. Now, most of you are mature enough in your faith, you already know, like, well, of course, yeah, not everybody is going to like you. But how many of us as human beings want everybody to like us? Right, if someone just came up to you and was like, I don't really like you, it would probably drive you insane, right? It would hurt your feelings, but then you'd spend all day going, why would they say that? Why don't they like me? I'm awesome. Look at all these other people that like me, right? And so Jesus looks at his disciples and he goes, I just want you to know something. Not everybody will like you because you follow me. Not everybody's gonna like what you believe. Not everybody's gonna like what you do. Not everybody's gonna like what you say if you are faithful to me. And then Jesus goes on and he tells them, it's because that's how they treated me. So they're not gonna treat you and I differently or better, Jesus says, than him, our master. But then he gives them these words of warning, but he also gives words of encouragement for those moments. He says, be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. So Jesus is telling them, look, look, if you follow me, and if you read what happens to the early church, and you've been following along in the book of Acts and seeing what happens to Paul, you know that what Jesus says comes true. They get mistreated, they get persecuted, they get brought before judges and councils and kings and emperors, all these things. And yet Jesus says, but here's a purpose behind it so that you can give a witness to them. You can tell them why you live the way you live. You can tell them about who Jesus is. And he goes on, he says, and then the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, you gotta love Jesus. He says, do not be anxious. I just, be honest with you, anytime Jesus or the Bible says don't worry or don't be anxious, that's like my personal least favorite part of the Bible, because I'm like, now just imagine, you're one of the disciples he's telling this to, you're Paul, and he's like, oh yeah, I, just, just a heads up, all of this bad stuff's gonna happen to you, but don't worry about it. Now if you had a friend or a family member that like, anybody ever been in those situations, friend, family member, maybe it's at work, and like right before a meeting happens or something goes down, they're like, oh, just a heads up, boss is really angry today. Oh, just a heads up, this terrible thing happened, everybody's on eggshells and totally worried. And then they look at you and be like, but don't worry about it, you're gonna be fine. Has anybody ever once in the history of humanity felt comforted by those words, don't worry about it, you'll be fine? What do you immediately do? Worry about it. <laughs> oh, God, this is going to be a terrible day and a terrible meeting. I don't want to be here anymore. And Jesus looks at his disciples and was like, just, just a heads up. They're all having a bad day. Lots of stuff's going to happen to you, suffering, persecution, mistreatment. It's not going to be good, but don't worry about it. You'll be fine. Now, if Jesus just stopped there, you would not like this verse, Right? Just to be honest, I know Jesus said it, and you're kind of confused right now. But if Jesus stopped there, you and I would be like, that's a terrible verse. This is not helping me. This is not comforting me at all. But he says to them, here's why you don't have to be anxious. Here's why when you get in those situations, you don't have to live in fear and worry. He says, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say what is ever given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. That's where the comfort comes from, the ability to, to not live in fear, to, the ability to not live in the anxiousness of, what am I going to say in this moment? How am I going to navigate this conversation? How am I going to talk about faith or Jesus when they're asking all these questions and I don't necessarily know the answers? What are they, how am I gonna respond if they don't like the way I live approve of the things that I do because I'm following Jesus and it doesn't make sense to them. And Jesus says, here's your power, here's your courage, here's your ability to get through those moments, navigate them, go through those conversations, say the right words. He says, the Holy Spirit will speak for you. 
Now, on a personal level, this is the most common prayer I say in my life. All right? I say it every week before I preach. Not that y'all are a big trial. I'm not afraid of you, but I would like to say the right things according to God's word, okay? Um, when I get asked hard questions as a pastor about faith or spirituality, when people have difficult circumstances and we're praying about them, did you know there is not a secret pastor's book with all the prayers in the world? I've looked for it, Google searched it, doesn't exist, all right? And so one of the most common prayers, if not the most common prayer in my life, is this verse from Mark chapter 13, where Jesus says, in those moments, don't be anxious, which is hard to do, but he says, here's why, because the Holy Spirit will speak for you. He will give you the words. So one of the prayers that I pray a lot is just this. Dear Jesus, you made a promise, and I need you to keep that promise in this moment and to send the Holy Spirit to speak for me and to give me the words that I need. And he never lets me down. Right? It's okay to go to God in your prayers and say, Lord, you made a promise, and I need you to keep that promise in this moment. Because, look, I get it. We're not exactly like Paul standing before a governor on trial, okay? We're gonna get into that story. But, like Jesus said, there's gonna be times where what? You and I face ridicule, criticisms. We're gonna face questions about why do you believe that? Why do you live like that? What does this mean to you, right? There's gonna be times where you and I feel, I don't know the answers. Or maybe your heart is filled with anxiety or worry because you're like, I don't know how to navigate this situation. I don't know how to have this conversation. And my encouragement to you would be, remember the promise of Jesus. He says, I'm gonna give you the Holy Spirit to guide you, to give you all wisdom, and to give you the words that you need to speak. So Jesus' words are difficult, they're hard, because no one's like, yay, instead of coming you for rest, people aren't gonna like us, right? Which sermon would you rather have? It's <laughs> not out there, right? So as we look at Paul's life here in Acts 24, if you open your Bible to Acts 24, we're gonna see that what Jesus said about his church became exactly true for the Apostle Paul. He is now on trial, he's been arrested, and in the previous chapters we looked at, it's because he was following Jesus, he was following the Holy Spirit. Everybody else around Paul was saying, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't do this, and yet the Holy Spirit told him, this is where you need to go. So Paul went there, he went to Jerusalem, and then he is going to face persecution and trials, and that they're gonna continue for the following chapters. So verse uh, 11 of chapter 23, God speaks to Paul right before he's going to be arrested, and he says to him, take courage, just so you know, every time in your Bible where you see it say, don't be afraid, fear not, take courage, be strong and courageous. You know why God says that to people? Because you're gonna need courage, right? Like, you don't need courage if the next day is just gonna be what? Super easy and comfortable. So God's telling them, I need you to take courage because what's gonna happen to you next is unfair, it's not right, it's unjust, but you're gonna go through it. He says, take courage for you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome, right? Remember what Jesus' words of Mark 13 were. I'm, you're gonna be in these situations so that what? You would have an opportunity to witness, to testify to who Jesus is, why you live the way you live, why you do the things that you do. So in chapter 24, Paul is on trial. They're making all kinds of accusations against him, and in verse 10, he's allowed to finally speak for himself. So the governor had nodded towards Paul and given him permission to speak, and so Paul said, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. Now, how many of you would, would have chosen the word cheerfully in your opening statement? Anybody? Now, remember the context. He's on trial for what? Being obedient to Jesus, right? You're in church, the answer is usually Jesus, right? So, Paul's on trial for being obedient to Jesus, doing exactly what Jesus had told him to do, obeying the guidance of the Holy Spirit, even when it was difficult, even when people are telling him, you're crazy, this is gonna end badly for you, 
And Paul stands up in his opening statement of this trial, which, by the way, shouldn't exist. He's innocent. He hasn't broken any laws. He's done nothing wrong. And he goes, I'm, I'm cheerfully about to give my defense. Paul is much more humble and respectful and kind than I would be in those moments. And we're going to find out why. So he says, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. So he's basically saying, you can verify, I've only been here for 12 days. I haven't been here as long as they're saying. I'm not doing the things that they're tell- saying about me, which was that he was been here a long time causing all kinds of riots and troubles and problems. And he says in verse 12, they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. So what Paul is saying is, here's what I will tell you is true about me. I'm not causing all these problems. I'm not starting a riot. I'm not picking fights. I'm not causing disputes. But here's what is true about me. I believe in the God of the fathers. His way of saying, I believe in the God of the Bible, and I believe what the Bible says about God and about us. Now, if you're a lawyer, you might realize this is not actually a helpful defense that will set Paul free. And if you've read all of Acts, you know, guess what? Paul never actually goes free. But he just stands there and goes, well, I don't know about all that. Like, I don't think it's true. It's, they, they're making the stuff up or whatever. And he knows that he's not getting out because all the people in power are against him. And he goes, here's the one thing I can tell you is true about me. I believe in the God of the Bible, and I believe what the Bible says is true about God and humanity. And that's his defense. It's like, that's, that's all you need. Like, false there is like, here's all you need to know about me. Believe in God and believe in the Bible. And then he says in verse 15, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. And if you jump down to verse 21, he's telling more of his defense. He's saying, the only thing that I said when I was before their council is this. I cried out while standing amongst them, It is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am trial before you this day. Now, how many of you are good at defending yourselves? Show a hand. Let's just all confess our sins before each other, right? And here's what I mean by that. How many of you have ever been wrong? Anybody want to raise your hand for that one? Just like throw it out there like, yeah, baby. I'm not going to admit it to anybody but I've been wrong. Usually when you are wrong and you're having an argument hypothetically with someone you probably love, how many of you have defended yourself to the death rather than say, I was wrong? Anybody brave souls in the room this morning? (laughs) Just like, yeah, I know I'm wrong. I'm not gonna tell them that, right? We as human beings are so good at what? Defending ourselves, right? Arguing for ourselves. Especially, what if you're not wrong? Anybody ever been right? Show of hands, who are willing to admit you were right? A lot more hands went up. That's all I'm saying. A lot more hands went up. Right? And then someone accused you of being wrong. What did you do then? You really probably defended yourself, right? You really laid out a whole bunch of arguments. Now, if you were paying attention to the story, Paul's on trial. All the accusations that are made against him are untrue. They did not happen. And Paul does what? He just says, "Um, here's what I'll tell you about me. I believe in God, I believe in the Bible, and I believe in the resurrection of the dead. You know what that doesn't do? Defend Paul in any way against the accusations that are being made against him. Right? Paul just stands there and goes, 
well, what they're saying is wrong, but he doesn't get into a whole big argument about it. And he just says, here's what I know is true. When he starts in verse 14, he says, but at this I confess you, confess to you, that I worship the God of the Bible. I worship the God of our fathers. I believe in the Bible, what it says about us, and I believe in the resurrection of the dead. This is astounding to me. Because if I was in Paul's place, I would have really not been nice, right? I would not have said kind things. I would not have been respectful. I would have defended myself to the death and tried to do everything in my power to prove them wrong. One of my favorite movies of all time is a movie called Braveheart with Mel Gibson. Like every dude I meet goes, yeah, I love that movie. So one of my favorite scenes in this movie is when uh, the Scottish army led by Mel Gibson is on one side of the battlefield, and on the other side you have the English army, and they're outnumbered and everything, and all of his co-leaders are trying to convince him, you should just surrender or make a peace with them. Let's, Let's not make a big scene here. And while they're discussing this, William Wallace, Mel Gibson's character, begins to ride his horse across the battlefield to the other side, and they all ask him, where are you going? And he turns around, and he smiles at him and goes, I'm gonna go pick a fight. Now, I love that scene. It makes for a great movie scene. It makes for a terrible attitude as a Christian. If we were in Paul's position here, at least for myself, my natural instinct would be, I'm gonna pick a fight with these people, and I'm gonna win that fight. I'm gonna make sure they know that they're wrong and I'm right. Because what's happening? I mean, like how many of you want to be falsely accused of something in your life? Or if it's happened to you, how many of you go, that was a fun day, I really enjoyed it, right? But that's what Paul's facing. And instead of standing in the courtroom and looking at the other side and saying, I'm gonna pick a fight, you know what he does instead? What Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, he said, I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to talk about Jesus. Here's the reality of living in this world. Not every human being you meet will like you. Not every person you meet is going to like your faith in Jesus. They're not gonna always like Christianity. They're certainly not always gonna like the church. And they're probably not even always gonna like Jesus. And they're going to make accusations. In other parts of the world, there is oppressive types of persecution where people are losing their lives and being jailed and imprisoned like Jesus talked about, like Paul faced. Here, more often than not, it is, we don't like you. Right? Or we're going to say things against you, we're going to make fun of you, we're going to insult you, all those kinds of things. And when that happens, when what Jesus talked about Mark 13 comes true for Paul and for you and me and for anybody else, when that happens and we feel like I'm on trial for my faith, I'm on trial for Jesus, we have a choice to make in how we respond. We can respond... Like, Bramar would be like, I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to pick a fight, and I'm going to make sure they know how wrong they are, and then conveniently how right I am. Now, one thing that Paul doesn't do is he doesn't shy away from the truth. Right? He doesn't hide what's going on, does he? He says, here is what's going on. Here is who I am. I believe in God. I believe what the Bible says about God, and I believe in the resurrection of the dead, right? He doesn't hide away from the fact that he is a follower of the way, that he is a Christian, that he loves Jesus. But I want you to see the attitude, the way Paul interacts with people is he does it with a sense of honor and dignity and respect. He doesn't pick a fight. He doesn't tear them down. He doesn't attack anybody. What does he do? He just says, but the, in verse 14, he says, but this is what I confess to you, right? He doesn't even really address the accusations. He kind of just glosses over them. He's like, yeah, they're saying these things. 
I haven't been, I've only been here for 12 days, so they're not true. But here's what really matters to me. I want to tell you about my God. I want to tell you about my Jesus. He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't fight until everybody goes, oh, we were so wrong, and let's free Paul. By the way, Paul, the next few chapters to spoil all the sermons coming up are just more trials for Paul. He's not going to go free, but he doesn't care. Because what matters most for Paul is the opportunity to share Jesus. Now, here's why I began the sermon with all the wonderful promises that you and I love. By the way, I'm I'm with you on all these things, okay? (laughs) I prefer Jeremiah 29, 11 and Matthew where Jesus says, you could come to me and I will give you rest over the, you're gonna stand before people on trial, but don't worry about it, you'll be fine. Okay, so, but why did I bring with us? Because we want, if it was up to us, the opportunity to share Jesus and who he is and what he means to us would be super easy and smooth sailing, right? It would just be this wonderful, it would be like Pentecost every day in your neighborhood. I told about Jesus one time, and 3,000 people believed. How many of you would like that? And you'd just be like, that would be so much better than the whole trial thingy where people don't like me and I have to give a defense, right? Like, how many, just show of hands, how many of you prefer Pentecost? You're like, I told them one time and they're all like, let's get baptized versus everybody hates me and I don't like it. But here's the reality. This is why I started with Mark 13. Those are Jesus' words. He's not trying to pull the wool over your eyes. He's not trying to trick you or deceive you. He's telling you up front, it will be like this sometimes. So how do we respond? Because I think we know the answer is like, well, of course I'm going to share Jesus. Of course I would defend Jesus. Of course I would want people to believe in Jesus. And all those things are true. But I want you to see how Paul goes about it. Because one of the things that has happened in our culture, we live in a day and age that many people call the age of outrage, right? That's why we get clickbait, and that's what the news is. And every time you go online, it's something posted, and it's written in a way, and the headlines are written in a way to make you do what? Throw your phone. You're like, that's not right. That's not true. And then for you to do what? Go pick a fight get angry. And it's written so the other people that believe and think the opposite way you do, do what? Respond the same way. And because we live in this environment and in this culture where people act this way, it is very tempting and it's very easy for you to use the internet as a megaphone to what? To pick a fight. To put people down. To tear them apart. But what does Paul do? He doesn't pick a fight. He doesn't hide from the truth. He's not weak. He's not fearful. The Lord told him, I want you to take courage, right? But how does he do it? He, he speaks respectfully to the people that put him on trial. You know those people that put him on trial are all lying and making up false accusations against him. And if anybody was justified in standing and going, this is an outrage and getting angry, it would be Paul. But Paul just respectfully says, your honor And then gently speaks and says, here's what I know is true about God and the Bible and Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, half of this verse you are very familiar with, the other half usually gets left off. I'm going to read the whole thing, though. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. How many of you have heard that phrase before? A little familiar, right? Always be prepared to give an answer, to give a defense of what? The hope that is in you. And many people are like, amen, pastor. Like, that is right. We gotta be ready to give a defense. We gotta be ready to pick a fight. We gotta be ready to go toe-to-toe with all those heathens. I don't know if anybody uses that word anymore. Anyway. (laughs) But we got to be ready to engage and argue and fight, fight, fight. 
And that's an attitude you can adopt if you only read that part of the verse. The second half of the verse in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, yet, or but, it's an interruption, yet, do it with gentleness and respect. That's very different than the way our world goes about things. Our world is obsessed with outrage and anger and picking fights with each other. So when Jesus tells his disciples, I want you to be in the world, but not of the world. I want you to go in the world, and I want you to love people. And I want you to tell them about the God of the Bible. I want you to tell them what the, the truths of the Bible say. I want you to tell them about the resurrection of the dead through Jesus Christ as Savior. I want you to do all those things. But don't do it in the way that the world always does it with their arguments and their philosophies and their worldviews. Where it's right now, it's like, oh, we just gotta pick a fight, you gotta argue, you gotta put people down. Like, I love Peter. Peter is one of the people, by the way, who went through persecution and trials and tribulations that Jesus talked about. At the end of the Gospel of John, there's this wonderful scene with Jesus and Peter, you're probably familiar with it, where Peter has denied Jesus three times and he's heartbroken about it, and they're having fish tacos for breakfast and they're sitting on the beach, and Jesus is talking to Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? And anybody know this story? Hey, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus goes, so feed my sheep. Oh, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. And he asks for a third time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's hurt by it, and he says, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. And everybody loves that story. You know why? Because it's about Jesus' love and forgiveness for knuckleheaded sinners like Peter and like you and me. What we tend to leave off in the Bible reading <laughs> and the Sunday school lesson and your devotion is the rest of the story where Jesus looks at Peter and says, one day people will lead you where you don't wanna go and they will dress you in a way you don't wanna be dressed and they will lay you out in a way you don't wanna be laid out. And then John has a little statement where he says, this was the show by which way he would die. And ultimately Peter dies by being crucified. So Peter is one of those people who was told by Jesus, look, not everybody's gonna like you. Not everybody's gonna respond well to you sharing the message and hope of Jesus and the resurrection of the dead. Peter faced all kinds of persecution throughout his life, even up to death. And when he says, I want you to be ready as a Christian to give a reason for the hope that is in you, ready to give a defense of it. Peter, like Paul, would be on a human level, have every right to be like, let's get outraged. Let's get angry about how they're treating us and mistreating us, how they're judging us and accusing of us of false things. And yet this same Peter tells the church, but here's how to do it. Do it with gentleness and respect. What a unique witness in our day and age for a Christian to be kind and to show gentleness and respect and to be known for those things. So yeah, we're gonna be on trial like Peter and like Paul throughout our lives. You're gonna have to answer questions. You're gonna have friends and family members that don't agree with you on faith. But the way to share the faith with them. The way Paul did it, the way Peter encouraged us to do it is not to tear people apart, not to destroy them, not to put them down, not to constantly pick fights, but to share the good news, the love and kindness and mercy and love of Jesus with gentleness and respect. And if you do that, you will be so unique and so different in our world right now. You will actually do what Paul in Philippians chapter two tells the church, he says, you will hold out the word of life and you will shine like stars in the universe. You will have a unique light to shine in the world by sharing the faith and the love of Jesus, but by doing it differently than the rest of the world does. By doing it the way Jesus calls us to do, through his word, by saying, do it with gentleness and respect. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you 
have come to redeem us and to save us, that it is your kindness that has led us to repentance. Lord, let us receive that kindness, your mercy, your grace and salvation with joy and hope. And let us go into a world and share it at every opportunity we are given, doing so with gentleness and respect so that we may shine like stars in the universe as we share the word of life. In the name we pray, amen.